Hey, this is problem number two from your last homework assignment. Um, problem titled Force Versus Time. Um, you're probably all very familiar with uh, the graph. Uh, everyone's graph <coughs> looked exactly the same. Um, and it denoted, um, you know, force here along what is traditionally the, the y-axis and time along the x-axis. <coughs> and the question was asked, told you a, a situation that had some initial speed um, some quantity of initial speed. The initial speed for my problem happened to be four meters per second. <clears throat> and it asks you what the, the final velocity was after some period of time. I think everyone's was the same. It was still this 11 seconds as it goes from zero to 11 here. Okay. Um, and so the, the general idea, there's, there's probably a number of ways that you could go about this, but I think the one that I often told uh, most students um, is some combination of the fact that, well, we have an object. Um, it's actually an ice block, uh, so it probably moves without any friction. Um, there's only one force that acts on it while it's moving in the x direction, and that's the force that's shown here on the graph. Um, so we know that the net force is equal to mass times acceleration from Newton's second law and that the only force acting on this in the x direction is this force F sub x. And so we can describe the acceleration of this object simply by taking whatever the value is of the force and dividing by the mass. <coughs> so we can do one of two things. Um, we can either kind of rewrite this whole graph here in terms of acceleration versus time by simply dividing by whatever the mass was for your particular problem. Um, and that would simply change the values of this function. So uh, the, the, my mass of my object is 15 kilograms. So my graph would go from zero here to 6 fifteenths uh, meters per second squared. So that would be 6 the force here, 6 newtons divided by the mass, uh, 15 kilograms. Um, or what we can also do uh, first, so we can divide by the mass throughout and kind of basically get a brand new picture that looks identical but has different values on the horizontal and the vertical axis. Um, or what we can do is get some information about what the average value of the force is at each of these points in order to figure out some information uh, about that. So I think for the course of this video, and because I don't want to redraw everything and hopefully and confuse everyone in that manner, I'm going to kind of re I'm going to sketch this out a little bit and talk about the average values of the force. So the fact that these are all linearly increasing and decreasing tells us that we can figure out what the average force acting on this object is over these different time intervals. Right? If we know what the average force is, um, we can describe what the average acceleration is, again, by dividing by the mass. And what will the average acceleration tell us? Well, the average acceleration will tell us the change in velocity over that interval divided by the change in time of that particular interval. So as long as we can determine the average acceleration, we, can, we, we know what the change in velocity is going to be for a particular time interval. So um, a lot of times what we did in class was we, we had uh, graphs of velocity versus time. And in those cases, we would simply take final minus initial of the velocity, divide by the change in time, and figure out what the average acceleration is. Well, we don't have a graph of velocity versus time. We have one of force versus time. And so that's why we need to take this procedure of somehow getting to the acceleration of this object from the information given here. Um, because this is uh, something here, this is an increasing value, it starts off at a notch of 2 here. It's not actually labeled, but we have a sense that this is 2 blocks up, so that's 2 meters, two newtons. Um, and it goes from 2 to 6, so the average value between these two would be 6 plus 2, just like you take the average of you know 80 and 100. You have two exam scores of 80 and 100, right? The average value of that would be 90. The average value of 2 and 6 is 4. It's 8 it's 6 plus 2, which is 8, divided by 2. So we can think of the value of the, of the force underneath this whole curve as simply being a constant value with this average of equal to 4 meters per second squared. Oh, so, sorry, of, of 4 newtons. This is still newtons. Um, and then during, so that's from a time interval of 0 to 2 seconds. Then from an interval of 2 to 5 seconds, we have a constant value. So we, there's no problem figuring out what the, uh, the force is, the average force here. Um, then from 6 to 0, 
this is something where the magnitude of the force is decreasing, but it's still above the zero point, right? This is still a positive force. I think a lot of people, what they started doing is like, oh, it's decreasing, therefore it's negative. Nope, negative means below zero, right? I mean, here's actually, it shows you negative four, right? Negative is below this, um, the time axis here, right? As it goes below, goes to negative values of force, then it's negative. Just because it's decreasing doesn't mean it's negative. It's, it's still a positive value. And in fact, this goes from zero to six, so that means the average value is at four, right? We're kind of blocking this off. So we're going to try to, um, so this average value at this interval is this value right there. The average value of the force between six seconds and seven seconds is minus two newtons. Then from seven seconds to nine seconds is minus four newtons. And then from nine seconds to 11 seconds again is minus two newtons, all right? So that kind of, these lines here kind of give us a, um, an idea of what the, the average force is for these different time intervals. So once we have what those values are, we have four newtons, six newtons, three newtons, minus two newtons, minus four newtons, and two, minus two newtons again here. Again, this is something where it's increasing, but it's still negative because it's below the zero point, right? It's below where the force is equal to zero. Um, and so what we're going to do is we can now figure out what the average acceleration is by taking all of these values and dividing them by our mass, which is a positive number. So these three will be positive. These three will be negative, whatever your mass was. Um, let's say for simplicity's sake, you had a mass of two kilograms. So you could write something like, well, in this interval, instead of uh, four newtons, the acceleration was equal to um, two meters per second squared. We take four newtons divided by two kilograms. In this interval, it would be three meters per second squared. In this interval, it would be three halves meters per second squared, et cetera, right? It's, that's a positive value while it's above the, the zero point, and then these would be negative values, right? Two newtons divided by two kilograms is one meters per second squared, and so on. Um, once you have those values of the acceleration, um, you can actually determine, uh, you need to multiply, so now we have the average values of the acceleration, we know what the time interval is for each of these, you just now multiply those to figure out what the change in the velocity is. So in the time, the first time interval, um, so that would maybe be like delta T1 is equal to two seconds, um, so from zero to two seconds, right, what we're going to be doing is taking the average acceleration at that point, which is two meters per second squared, multiplied by the time interval, two seconds, gives us a change in the velocity, which is equal to four meters per second. Notice that we have meters per second squared, and multiplying by seconds, one of the seconds drops out, we get an additional, a change in velocity of four meters per second, and it's a positive value. Um, and we can go along piecewise like this. In the second interval, uh, we have three meters per second. The acceleration is positive three meters per second squared times three seconds. The seconds, one of the seconds drops out. Um, so the change in velocity for interval two is plus nine meters per second. So these are just the, the changes in the velocity. So we can do this for the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth time interval. Um, noting that we have six different unique time intervals. Uh, three are positive, three are negative, and we're going to sum all of those quantities up so that we take whatever our initial value was and we're going to add up all of these changes to the velocity and that'll tell us what the final velocity is going to be at 11 seconds. All right? And we can see already that our initial velocity was in meters per seconds. We're simply adding meters per seconds. Those units came through the problem and our final answer will be also be in meters per second. So when we plug that in, we know that that's going to be right. Okay? I hope that was helpful.